Hardly a week goes by without yet another depressing reminder of the century-long impact that climate change is having on the planet. And we see this in many different ways through the overall global warming profile of Earth, through to unprecedented droughts and heat waves and fires, the relentless deterioration of the polar ice sheets. And in parallel with this, and probably driven by it in, in some sense, the humanity as a whole has increasingly, you know, lovingly, longingly looked towards Mars as a potential lifeline, uh, a so-called second Earth, if you like, Earth Mark II. And this has long been the, I don't know, if you like, the, the playground of science fiction authors, more recently, maybe entrepreneurial billionaires, and as time has gone by, scientists have embraced this idea and started to investigate some of the challenges that those potential colonists might face as they try to establish a base on Mars. And there are a lot of significant challenges. And the reality, looking at some of the results that have come back thus far, the reality is that Mars is a very harsh, barren, hostile environment that doesn't always mesh with the sort of this panacea that we may believe that Mars may offer in terms of a, a long-term alternative habitat for humanity. And so what I would like to do is take a step back, and you may think that that is a rather sobering introduction, in some sense it is, and just take a look at what some of those challenges are. What, what will those first colonists actually face in terms of setting up and establishing a long-term community on Mars? And there is sort of a, an elephant in the room that probably does need to be addressed first, and that's before you ever actually arrive at Mars. And that's simply the reality that one in 10 space missions fail. Now, many of them fail for very minor reasons, uh, some of them for very catastrophic reasons, and that is just the reality of, of space exploration. You have to live with those sorts of statistics. And to maybe put it into a context that might resonate with most of us, Imagine, say, showing up at a major airport, heading off on vacation with the family. Maybe, you know, by major airport, I mean one that has, say, a thousand departures heading out every day. And being told at check-in that 100 of those flights are not going to make it to their destination. Some, again, for minor reasons, some for potentially catastrophic reasons. If you are like me, you're probably going to wrap your arms around the family and quickly do a runner. But astronauts are, in general, cut from a different cloth than maybe the average person. And while nobody likes those statistics, it is something that they accept as, as part of the job. So let's now sort of move beyond that, that elephant in the room and assume that we have made it to Mars. And those first intrepid travelers, they step outside the lander. What is it that they're going to be faced with? What are those challenges? And the first one, and it's an obvious one, and they've been warned about it in advance, but when you step outside that lander, the first thing that strikes you is that it is very cold. Mars is really, really cold. You know, it's, its average temperature is much colder than the average temperature of the coldest place on Earth, high up in the Antarctic Plateau. Temperatures reach down below minus 100 degrees centigrade. And look, our bodies are not designed to thrive and enjoy an environment at minus 100 degrees centigrade. So a reality of life in Mars is that you're going to spend predominantly the rest of your life indoors. It's maybe somewhat claustrophobic. It may not be a whole lot of fun, but that is just the reality of what life will be like on Mars. Now, we do have some limited experience with scientific bases on the high Antarctic plateau. So we sort of know what we're getting ourselves into. And like I said, it may not be fun, but it's at least doable. The second thing that probably will pop into your mind as you step outside of that lander is, where am I going to get the power to sustain this colony, this life on Mars? In the long term, you know, you'll probably have things like nuclear power generators and geothermal sources of energy. But in the short term, you really have to make do with what's there. And that typically boils down to sort of wind energy and solar energy. Now, Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere at all. So that means the amount of wind energy you can draw upon is very minimal. You are going to have to rely on solar energy. Now, the fact that Mars doesn't have an atmosphere, there's actually one positive attached to that, is that radiation that comes from the sun, instead of being absorbed by the atmosphere or reflected by the atmosphere, as a large fraction of it is here on Earth because of our atmosphere, 
that solar radiation that we need to power solar cells and batteries and panels actually makes it to the surface. So even though Mars is significantly further away from the sun than Earth is, it's a comparable amount of solar energy that you can draw upon. So that's at least one positive thing. There is that source of energy that you can use to, to power your, your colony. And an obvious follow-up question to that is, what are those colonists going to eat? What are they going to drink? And the short answer to the question, are there food sources and liquid water sources on Mars, is no. For several generations, you will have to depend upon deliveries from Earth. And you can do it. You can take sort of the maximum capacity payloads that we can deliver now, and you could probably fill that with enough food to sustain 100 colonists for a year. It's fraught with danger. It's expensive, probably costs about a half a billion pounds to send enough food to sustain 100 people on Mars for a year. But again, it's doable. And there is a, a little bit of cause for optimism in terms of, of water in the long term, not, not today. When we look at Earth, we know that there are subterranean water ice sheets. They're hard to identify from where we sit here on Earth, but once you get to the surface of Mars, there's some optimism that we'll be able to find these. Long-term thinking is that you set up a big dome and you have microwave generators and you fire mi microwaves down into the soil that heats up the soil and liberates that ice into a form that will be useful to, to the colonists. Now, people are working on this technology now. We don't have this today. So maybe in a generation or two, those colonists will be able to extract that water ice into a form that they can use. But at least for the foreseeable future, again, probably a generation or two, you'll have to make do with water that's shipped from planet Earth and more importantly, you have to set up an incredibly efficient water recycling system, effectively 100% efficiency, in the same way that the astronauts on the International Space Station have to deal with. They have effectively have a 100% efficient recycling system for their water. So we can do it, but those are sort of the challenges that you face. Long term, of course, you would hope to take advantage of the fact that Mars is covered in soil, and you would like to be able to plant crops, do farming, and have a sustainable food source. The problem for right now and for the next few generations is that the soil on Mars is highly toxic. It's filled with something called perchlorates. And animal life, plant life, bacterial life really does not like perchlorates. So there's a lot of work being done amongst the various space agencies to develop technologies that will efficiently uh, clean and filter those perchlorates from the soil. And again, we, don't, we haven't mastered that technology yet, but again, there's some cause for optimism in the next generation or two that will be able to deploy this successfully on Mars and actually have a sustainable food source to, to cut that cord with planet Earth and those food and water deliveries that we will need for the next few generations. Um, there are two maybe more problematic issues to deal with, and I've alluded to one of them, the lack of an atmosphere and what that, the consequent effect of that in terms of radiation levels at the Earth, at the, at the surface of Mars. Now, that lack of an atmosphere I, I mentioned was a positive in terms of getting radiation that we need to power our solar cells and batteries and panels. The problem is that's kind of the good energy that makes it to the surface. Along with that good energy is nasty radiation that also filters right to the surface without anything to protect you. So that means the damaging radiation that will damage DNA also makes it unfiltered to the surface. And so the damaging radiation levels at the surface of Mars are about a thousand times higher than they are here on planet Earth. So what that means, that lack of an atmosphere and that lack of um, protection from radiation is twofold. You're going to have to live inside of a pressurized environment because without an atmosphere, there's no atmospheric pressure pushing on you. What that means is that it reduces the boiling temperature of water and it's a bit not so fun to talk about, but it reduces it to a level that the water inside your body would start to boil. So if you are outside, you need to wear a pressurized suit to ensure you don't boil to death, which sounds very weird given the temperature. Uh, but it also means you're going to be spending most of your time indoors inside of a pressurized environment. And you're also going to be likely be deep underground or inside of structures that have meter thick steel walls to protect you from that damaging radiation. So yes, you do get the positive of having solar energy to power those cells, but you also got DNA damaging radiation a thousand times higher than our body is comfortable with and no atmospheric pressure to protect you from boiling to death. The last physiological effect is the microgravity environment. The gravity on Mars is a lot lower than it is on, on Earth and you also have that year-long trip to get to Mars where you're in zero gravity. And this is a big unknown for us. We, we do know that at some level 
microgravity environments are really bad for your cardiovascular system, your central nervous system. It has an impact on your ability to reproduce. But we haven't really quantified that. We haven't really wrapped our heads around just how serious this physiological effect will be. Again, this is work that's being done right now, but this is a challenge, and it, it's an unknown challenge that we face for those first colonists setting up that colony on, on Mars. And beyond all those physiological effects, maybe the most challenging are the psychological effects of living in an environment where you have a complete lack of freedom of movement. You will be confined, for the most part, indoors, climate controlled, pressurized controlled, deep underground, protecting you from, from radiation. These all have a psychological effect. The few times when you are allowed to go outside, you're going to be faced with an environment that is very monochrome and monotonous in color. And maybe beyond all of those sorts of psychological effects is the fact that you will spend the rest of your life not ever being able to communicate in real time with family and friends back on Earth because there is roughly a 10-minute communication lag between the two planets. And so the only people you will be able to talk to, if you like, are the, your fellow colonists who are sitting there on, on Mars with you. So when you weigh up all of these physiological and psychological effects, it does beg the question, rather than trying to adjust to this really harsh environment, is there not some way that we could adjust Mars to make it more hospitable to us, so-called terraforming the planet? Now, the short answer to this is maybe. Uh, the polar regions of Mars are covered in ice, but it's carbon dioxide ice. And so if we can develop the technology that allows us to heat up those poles, you can liberate that carbon dioxide and potentially drive sort of a runaway greenhouse effect and establish an atmosphere. If you want to think of it this way, you could think of it as a positive runaway greenhouse effect rather than maybe the negative connotation it has here on Earth. And that would alleviate some of the concerns and, and challenges associated with not having an atmosphere on, on, on Mars. It's not an atmosphere you can breathe, but it would protect you from radiation and would provide that atmospheric pressure that would allow you to you know, not boil away if you mistakenly don't have your suit on at any given time. It does beg the question about you know, the ethics of, of terraforming planets to suit us, but that's a topic for another day. And even the most optimistic of terraformers suggests you're looking at one to 2,000 years before we could even have the ability to do this. We don't have the technology to do this right now. So this is something we're looking you know, way downstream, many, 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 many generations from now. So you can weigh up all of those physiological, so psychological effects. And it does beg the question, is, is, is this the right approach? Is, is Mars really this, this panacea, this, this second home for humanity? Um, to me, at, at first glance, no, it is not. And hopefully it's given at least some pause for thought that it isn't quite as rosy as maybe it is painted in, in the media from, from certain directions. And I think what I want to do is leave you with just a few personal talking points, reflections on this, and I sort of boil it down to, to four very simple questions. Will we actually visit Mars? I think most definitely we will. I think there's too much vested interest from various governments and, again, entrepreneurial billionaires to suggest this is not going to happen in the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years. It, it, it's going to happen. We will put feet down on the soil of, of Mars uh, in, in the lifetime of maybe some of the, the younger people in, in the room and, and listening today. Can we actually col colonize Mars? Yeah, you probably could. I think you have to weigh up all of those challenges that I just talked about and say, yeah, you probably could. It's not going to be a, a fun existence. You may be, again, living in a pressurized underground can, but you probably can eke out some sort of basic existence on Mars. Now, will we actually do it? I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, humans as a whole, we are genetically predisposed to enjoy a temperate climate. This is not something that looks particularly inviting, so I'm not sure there's going to be a mass exodus to, to Mars. And should we actually colonize it is probably the, the, the biggest question. I have not yet seen a convincing argument that suggests to me that this is really a viable solution for the problems that we, that we face on Earth. We really need to step back, be a little bit more introverted, look at what it is that we are doing and what we are doing to planet Earth and what we can do to make this habitat be as, as positive going forward as we possibly can. And the way I like to think of this is, look, our genetic DNA, we, we want to open doors. We want to break through. We want to see what's on the other side. But if you were to ask me, the door to colonizing Mars is one of those doors that should remain closed.
Thank you.